I would like to take this opportunity, first of all, to thank the Reverend Ferguson for the opportunity to bring a personal word of testimony, to share and to tell about the grace of God that has triumphed in my heart and in my life. You know, a testimony is really the story of what the Lord has done for any poor sinner. And what a wonderful story each and every one who is redeemed has to tell of God's goodness and God's grace. Before I relate what the Lord has done for me, I'm just going to read some verses from God's Word, found in 1 Timothy and the chapter 1. And here the Apostle Paul was writing. I'm writing to Timothy and going to read here from the verse 12. Paul basically tells us something a little bit about his past. He doesn't glory in past sins, doesn't go in great depth, but he does tell us something about the man that he was and how God's grace had saved and changed him. Read here in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and the words of verse 12, where Paul writing said, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I did, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Amen. And we trust and pray that God will bless the public reading of his word to all of our hearts. Wonderful to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. It was John Newton who penned those beautiful words, very famous hymn known worldwide, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, spiritually blind, but now I see. I'm going to relate the story of how the Lord found me, rescued me, saved me, transformed me, and of course what the Lord Jesus Christ means to me. And I want, of course, to just have it put on record, my great sense of indebtedness to the Lord himself for all of his mercy and his grace. I work as a missionary to the addicted, so my ministry as a missionary really involves dealing with those who are caught up with stubborn addictions, life-controlling habits, most of them would be involved in drug addiction. And sometimes that involves me helping out with a, a residential centre, a men's home down in Dublin. Currently, I have three lads from Northern Ireland who are in that programme. It's a one-year discipleship programme. It's Jesus Christ who makes men free. And those lads are in that one-year programme, not only to come away from drugs, but Ultimately, it's the Lord that will set them free and deliver them. And we pray that the Lord will indeed do that for them. But I remember one occasion being down in the program in the men's home in the residential center, and I was doing a, a sleepover. I was minding the, the center um, overnight. And so I was doing that evening time shift. And I remember hearing a lad, he was going to the bathroom quite a lot during the night. He was being physically sick. He had the hot and cold sweats. He had the vomit and the diarrhea, all those things. And he, he really was in a mess. And for me, what it did was it transported me back in time just to remind me of where God had brought me from. Oftentimes, as a missionary to the addicted, I deal with those individuals, those people whose lives are really destroyed through their sinful practices, and sinful practices and through their habits and their lifestyle. And oftentimes for me, it's, it's like looking in a mirror because I see myself in their lives. And yet 
I know the grace of God that has triumphed in my heart and my life. And of course, that encourages me to press on and to pray for them and to reach out to them, praying that God will indeed set them free. I was born and brought up in Northern Ireland in the city of Lisburn. Lisburn is roughly about seven or eight miles outside of the capital Belfast. And I was brought up as a young boy, the youngest of three brothers. I have two older brothers. And right from I was a young child, I was greatly blessed. And in the sense that there was an interest um, for my mother to send me to a local Sunday school. And whenever I went to Sunday school, there I heard the great message of the gospel. I remember being in those meetings, sitting as a young boy, hearing great texts like John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There as a young child, I was faithfully taught the gospel. My mother and father, whilst good people, they weren't saved. They didn't know the Lord personally. Now, my mum and dad, they both used to go to church, say their prayers, read their Bibles. And most people would have, from looking outwardly at them, would have thought, well, surely that's what a Christian is. But there was no inward change in their heart. They hadn't repented and turned away from their sin. When I was just a, a young boy, I think around about the age of seven or eight it was, my mother came home one night. She had been going out night after night, and she came home this evening, and she said to my father and to myself, she said, you know, I've got saved. I've become a Christian. Now, my mum didn't swear. She didn't use offensive language. She didn't smoke. She didn't drink alcohol. You know, she, she really was a, a a perfect neighbor in many respects. But she came to realize that the Bible teaches for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That very evening, she trusted Christ as Savior. And there's nothing like a mother's prayers. If I'm speaking to a mother this evening, or when the message is being broadcast, can I say that the greatest thing that you can give your children is your prayers. And my mother prayed for me, and I sincerely thank the Lord for that. My mum and dad both had great hopes and dreams and aspirations for me. They wanted me to be like my older brothers, get a good education, be financially secure, get good employment, and be successful in life. But they watched as those hopes and dreams for me were shattered and torn apart. Sadly, from a very young age, I began to get involved in the things of the world. It all started for me by taking a cigarette, smoking a cigarette tobacco down in our local park in Lisburn. Now, I want to really stress the importance of friends. Friendship is vital. We're all like the people that we associate with and are friendly with. And I sadly had bad friends and wrong friends, friends who were going to influence me, not for good or for God, but rather for evil and that which was wicked. One friend in particular, he encouraged me to start smoking. It wasn't long before I was not only smoking, but I was beginning to taste alcohol and starting to drink alcohol. Now, the devil is very subtle. He is a master of deception. He knows how to lure, how to attract, how to entice. In fact, when we go back to Genesis and the chapter 3, the verse 1, we have the first mention of the devil in Scripture. Very important when we're looking at any subject or any issue that we consider what are called the laws of mention. 
the first time something is mentioned, further times it's mentioned in Scripture, and then the final time that that subject would be mentioned. Here we have the first mention of Satan himself. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, have God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. We find there that the devil came as a master of deception. Eve, are you sure that God really means what he says? Are you sure that God really said that? Here we find the first mention of the devil, that the Holy Spirit draws our attention to the very fact, and we need to underscore this and underline it and pay attention to it. He is a master of deception. He knows how to deceive. He is very cunning at his work. And here we find in the verse 1 that the only way that we can truly overcome the subtlety and the craftiness of Satan is by the word of God. You see, the two go together. The Lord Jesus Christ said, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And it's the truth of God's word and the truth of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. As a young man, sadly, I was making very bad decisions, wrong decisions, influenced by the, by the friendship of others. And it wasn't long before I was going further and further down that road, a road that was going to lead to many tears, heartache and pain, and suffering. I rebelled greatly against my parents, but of course I was rebelling against God. The Word of God says to honor thy father and thy mother. I am totally and completely ashamed of the fact that I dishonored my parents that for many years I broke my own mother's heart. And by that I mean because of my choices and the way I was living, she used to cry herself to sleep. She was literally a broken woman. And my lifestyle and my sinful choices were affecting the family. My dad used to say things to me that were very hurtful. I suppose he was watching on and he was seeing the hurt that my lifestyle was causing my mother and the heartbreak it was bringing. He used to say things like, I wish you'd never been born. You shouldn't be here. You're a mistake. My parents, I was born when my parents were in their 40s, 40 years of age plus, and my dad used to say, oh, you, you're not meant to be here. Do you know of all the things that my father said to me in my teenage years? Do you know the things that I remember? The things that hurt me. We need to be very careful with our words. The Bible says death and life are in the power of the tongue. And when we're dealing with our children and with our loved ones and others, we need to be very careful what we speak and how we speak. I left home at a very young age. I finished school as well. I wasn't allowed to stay in school. I was just 15, just a, in my middle teens. And for me, my whole outlook in life was, life is what you make it. Eat, drink, and be merry. If you're going to enjoy life, then Fulfill life and you really need to go out into the world and just partake of all that the world has to offer. And sadly and tragically, that's the way I live my life. I never ever imagined or intended becoming addicted to drugs. I mean, after all, I was from a good home, a good family. I had a good education but I just threw it all away. I went from one substance to another. In many respects, what I was doing was, I was 
searching and I was looking. And I was looking for life and satisfaction. But it's not to be found in the things of the world. The Word of God reminds us that none but Christ can satisfy. None but Christ. I am come that they might have life. life. Life with purpose, with meaning, with direction, with fulfillment. Life is found in Christ alone. I, after leaving home, then went for a while to live as a young boy just over the water, as we would call it, um, over in England, the capital, London. London has quite a, quite a big population, and there, as a 15-year-old, coming 16, I once again was in the wrong company with the wrong friends, and my life was just in a downward spiral. It's as if I was in free fall and nothing could stop me or nothing could stop the train that I was taking and going down. I remember times even over in London as a young boy being homeless, not having a friend in the world. It was... A very large, huge experience for me at that tender age. And yet, sadly, I still had no time for the things of God. There was one thing, however, that my mother had really taught me and sought to instill in me when she became a Christian. That was to respect the Bible, the Word of God. And so I had a small copy of the Bible, just a, a pocket edition of the New Testament. And everywhere I went, I always packed it in my bag. Now, looking at me here in the church wearing the suit with a, a necktie and a shirt on, my appearance when I was in my mid-teens was very, very different to say the least. Recently, I have been getting treatment to have tattoos removed from me. I have, have had them removed off my hands and be getting some more treatment soon for having them. The last marks are just coming off the head and all over the body. And my appearance at that time was one of not only rebellion, but hatred and, you know, just filled with my own pride My mum would look at me and she would just break down in tears. My father would look at me and he would say, I'm ashamed to call you my son. Oftentimes, working with those in addiction, I get to deal with people who are at the very brink of life. By that I mean they, they live right close to the edge. Any moment, their next fix could be their last. Their next use of drugs. Last year, sadly, quite a number of the lads that I work with passed away and died at a very young age. But I often think Dealing with those who are right, right down the very depths of sin and addiction. Lord, what you've done for me, you can and you're able to do for them. I think of how deep I was in addiction at that time and life just spiraled completely out of control. But you know, the Lord has people, his people, that he places in our pathway Thank the Lord for that. Those who have a positive influence, who have a godly influence. One of those people was my, well now my wife, Linda, would have been 
her great aunt, Aunt Violet. Undoubtedly, to me, the most godly person I have ever known. She's now in glory with the Lord. Aunt Violet, when she looked at me, she saw a broken mess, a young man who was taking drugs, heavily tattooed, who was just a complete mess. Never once did she say a cross or a harsh word to me. She prayed for me. She loved me. Whenever Linda and myself got married, we were, we were very young. I was 19. Linda was just 16. And it may be a surprise to hear that at our wedding, the time afterwards, the family, people were saying, well, where, where's, the, where's the drink? Where's the alcohol? No, no there's, no, there's no alcohol here today because Aunt Violet's present. We didn't want to offend her. She commanded respect. The most dear, sweet Christian lady. And what an influence she had in our lives. Oh, child of God, we can have such a wonderful impact on the lives of others. We can make a difference by the, by the very way we live, by the, what we say, what we do, all those things. We can have such a positive influence on others. The Bible says in Proverbs 22 verse 1, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. A good name, a good testimony, a name that you love the Lord and you're walking with God. That's what really matters. Linda, myself, a little while later, we had our first child born into this world. Linda gave birth to our little girl and when Samantha was born she was seven weeks premature which meant that she had to stay in hospital for a number of weeks until she was strong enough to leave but one night we had been down at the hospital visiting our little baby girl one night we came home and I started to think about life and to me, life was just so painful and I couldn't see any future. I couldn't see any hope. And that night, I determined I'm going to end my life. I'm going to give this little baby the best start in life by not being part of her life and ruining it. I thought about the heartache I'd caused my mum and my dad. It just seemed that everything was going wrong. And the thoughts that night in my mind were, your baby is going to die. There's no hope for you. And so I took a massive drugs overdose along with alcohol. I determined to die. But God, our sovereign God, determined that I would live. Psalm 30 and the verse 3 is really my life's testimony verse. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. I was very seriously ill from the overdose. Here's the thing. Nobody in the family was aware of the fact that 
I had, or I was seeking to end my life. They found me lying on the floor. They smelt the alcohol. And my mum said that she was really complaining, giving off, saying, you know, think he would have more respect. There's his little baby not well and not long married. And when's he ever going to wise up, see sense? Not realizing that I'd taken the massive drugs overdose. My mother told me sometime later, she said, she turned to my dad. It was in the early hours of the morning, maybe four or five o'clock in the morning. She turned to him and she said, there's something wrong. I don't know what it is. There's something wrong with him. Quick, call the paramedics, get an ambulance. They then came to realize I was fighting for my life. My wife said that she came to visit me in hospital that particular time that I was in for the overdose. I was critically ill. I was on a ventilator, life support machine, breathing for me. I wasn't expected to pull through to make it. My wife said that she came into the hospital, to the ward one day to visit me, even though I was on the life support machine. And she said that the minister that had married us was there kneeling beside my bed, publicly broken, crying, that the Lord would spare my life. I'm glad that God hears and answers prayer. I point blank refuse to give up on people. Those whose lives are wrecked and ruined, who are held captive by the devil, the world would say there's no hope, there's no future, they can't be reached. And the word of God reminds us that our God is able, Christ is able. He's able to save to the uttermost all who come to God through him. I pulled through, obviously, came home from the operation or from the overdose, and then our little girl, our little baby was released from hospital as well shortly after. A few months later, I was still just 19, I became critically ill. And the way I could sum it up is this. The body that God designed, created and made, it's just not made for substance abuse. God made man that man might know him and glorify him. Sadly, I'd abused the body for years and it's as if the body was saying, enough, no more. I went into hospital Spent 10 weeks, I think it was, the first time in hospital. I then had, after that time in hospital, three more years of intense sickness. I had a lot of problems with the stomach and other organs. And to this day, my body still feels the effects of my sinful lifestyle. But during that period of time in Going in and out of hospital, I had somewhere in the region of 60, 70 operations, something like that. I stopped counting 20, I think it was 24 I stopped counting at. But, but God in mercy was bringing me into contact and into the presence of other believers. The man who performed most of my surgeries was a Christian who prayed over all, of his patient, over all of his patients. It was actually in hospital that my life changed and changed forever. I'd just come through some major surgery. 
That surgery had lasted eight hours. I was improving. I was actually looking forward to getting home back to my family, getting out of hospital. Our little girl, Samantha, was now three years of age. I was 22. And then I became very seriously ill in a moment of time, whilst in hospital. Life can change so quickly. We do not know what a day may bring forth. We do not know. I became very seriously, critically ill quickly. I had what are called adhesions. So basically, my organs were sticking and twisting in my body and shutting down very quickly. It was a Saturday morning, the 26th of August, 1989, that I was told I would have to go for emergency surgery, basically life-saving surgery. But there are no mistakes with the Lord. The very man who had performed that surgery was a Christian, a very godly man, Dr. Robert Gilliland. Dr. Gilliland approached the bed. There I was, just a young man, early 20s, And I was broken and I was crying and I was very upset. And he said, what's wrong? You've faced lots of surgeries before. You're part of the hospital nearly. I said to him, Dr. Gilliland, I'm in darkness. As I look back on my life, as I look forward, it's just like the only way I could describe it is it's been surrounded in darkness. It's just pure darkness. I said, you know, I'm terrified of meeting God. You see, I knew that God was holy. But oh, I was so sinful. He told me the message of the gospel, the message of the cross. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures told me about the amazing grace of God and how that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now here's the thing. I could understand and believe that God could save other people, but, but not me in the depths of sin I'd been in. Two weeks prior to that, So two weeks before that very day, I was playing guitar in a heavy rock band. We played what's called black metal, which is satanic music. That's all that we played. Drugs, drink, everything that goes with it. And I said to him, No, but but God couldn't love me, not me. And he told me the sweetest story that ever mortal ears could hear, how that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. How he went all the way to Calvary's cross, And there he suffered, he bled and died. And there he laid down his life, a ransom for many. He died, the holy for the unholy, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. I hadn't the strength to get out of bed, to get down on my knees. I didn't know very much about the Bible, but I knew this, that I was a lost, guilty sinner Jesus Christ was my only hope. And there that day, the 26th of August, 1989, I called upon the name of the Lord and praise the Lord he saved me. How do I know that? Because the Bible tells me so. 
For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How do I know? I was there when it happened. How do I know? You just need to ask my wife. Because she'll tell you that that very day, she got a new husband. And to my shame, she needed one. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new, and all things are of God. It's the Lord that makes a difference. Oh, before I tried at times, tried to quit the substances, tried to come away from drugs, tried to clean up my life, be a better person, be a better father, a better husband, but it always failed because there was no change of heart. But now when the Lord saved me, he gave me a new heart with new desires, new delights, a new direction in life. What a blessing it is to know the Lord. What does Jesus Christ mean to me? What has he done for me? Just one word. Everything. He is my everything. He is my all. I am just a sinner saved by grace. As Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. The Lord has given to me his full free salvation, but purchased with highest price the precious blood of Jesus Christ the sinless, spotless Lamb of God bore away my sin. Three months later, the Lord saved my wife, mother-in-law, father-in-law, has blessed us with two other children. Our second child, when she was born, we named her Grace because of the grace of God that has triumphed in our hearts and lives. Then I have a, a young lad, he's now a teenager, he's, well he's 15, and his name is Josiah. And it is our prayer that the Lord might work in his heart as a young boy and raise him up like King Josiah in the Scriptures. God has blessed us above all measure. What a joy it is to know the Lord. What a blessing to be saved, to know the peace of God ruling and reigning in your heart to know that joy unspeakable, full of glory. I thank the Lord for all that he's wrought and done. But I believe the best is yet to be. The Lord called us to work for him, to labor for him as missionaries. Went to Bible college. What a blessing that was just to be in the presence of other Christians and to have that fellowship to grow, to develop in the things of God. And then to serve the Lord through our mission board and through our denomination and just all that the Lord has been doing for us and through us. We're so thankful to the Lord. You know, we are nothing. And I'm nothing. But Jesus Christ, he is everything. He really is. Please do pray for us as we continue to labor for the Lord as we reach out one of the most challenging sights I had as a young Christian reaching out to those in addiction was one evening when my wife and myself were out ministering to addicts in this one house that we went to the young lad sadly had, his mother had passed away. He was in chronic, chronic drug addiction, injecting heroin, and his life was just a total mess. My wife and myself like to practically help people. Some might say, well, you know, you've got to help yourself to get out of addiction. Well, that's true in the sense that a person has to seek that help and want that help. But aren't you glad that whenever we were in the addiction of our sin 
and bound in fetter by our sin. Are you glad that the Lord didn't look at us and just say, you got yourself into that mess, now you just get yourself out of it. No, I'm so thankful that the Lord loved me even when I was completely unlovable. We went in to this young man and I said to my wife, I said, if you want to clean up the kitchen area and tidy the, that living area, I'll go upstairs and I had some sort of an idea what I was going to see. I went into his room and all I, all I could describe it as was a, a room filled with used drug needles. It really touched the chord in my heart. And I began to lift them, to put them into the safe containers to dispose of them safely. And I began to count them and stop counting. Boxes and boxes, maybe upwards to 100 used needles. The young man came in the door tears streaming him, coming down his face, and he said, you don't have to touch him. Don't want you getting, maybe pricking your finger or something, or contracting some disease. And I said to him, son, listen to me. My wife, myself, we love you. But this poison that you pump into your veins is going to take you to hell, to everlasting ruin. I also said to him, we love you. But how much more does Jesus Christ love you? To go all the way to the cross at Calvary. There to pay the price for sin. It was some 18 years later, or roundabouts, that that young man came to the Lord and he's walking with the Lord. The Lord saved him. I could stand and I could testify for a long time. I'm not going to do that, but I could, I could tell you of Time after time, God's stepping in. What seemed an impossible situation, an impossible person to reach. But the Lord reached him. Just as you can't touch the leper. But Jesus Christ touched the leper and made him whole. I wonder, do you know the Lord? Are you saved? Do you know the joy of your sins forgiven, being at peace with God? If not, why not? Come to Christ. Trust the Lord. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul goes on to say, of whom I am chief. Not was chief, but I'm chief. You see, he, he, he doesn't want to get away from the grace of God and what the Lord has done for him. Neither do I. I am eternally indebted to the Lord. Jesus Christ, he paid it all and all to him I owe. May God bless the words of testimony, the story of God's grace, the triumph of the grace of God in a heart and life for his eternal glory. May God bless you, lead you, guide you, keep his hand upon you. In Jesus' name, amen.